need, that is the need for the hour, it has to do with our text tonight, Second Chronicles chapter 7, I mean it's the most familiar verse found in the Word of God. This is 2010, whatever you're going to do in 2009 is too late, but what we've got in 2010 is ahead of us. We can remember back to um, the things that God has done in years past. And God's not lost any of his power. He's just as powerful a God as he ever was. He's still wanting to bless us just as much. I sort of came up with a little slogan for maybe 2010 is, Lord, do it again in 2010. And I think you'll know what the doing it again means after the message tonight. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, you speak to our hearts tonight. Lord, I pray you to use me, loosen my, my tongue, Lord, you loosen my thoughts, so that I'll be able to, to preach the word of God and challenge the, the, the crowd that's here tonight. Lord, speak my own heart. Lord, and give us victory here tonight. And may Satan be totally defeated. And you get all honor and glory. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Revival has been a part of this country. You know, uh, studying with Joseph on part of his history, uh, history of the, the, our country, he was going through some things. He was talking about the great, rest, uh, great uh, awakening in the early years of our country. Revival came here. Revival was already experienced in our founding fathers. That this, the reason they came to the United States to start with. When they came to this country when it's totally unsettled, they wanted religious freedom, and our forefathers worshipped God. Yet even after that, when you open a, a new nation, you have some people who come strictly for the commerce involved. And it wasn't long till uh, sin was spreading rampant in, in our, even in our colonial America. But God was there. And the people of God were there, and they were willing to pay the, pay the price for revival. And you know, God's no less powerful now than he was then. It was asked of an old preacher one time, he says, Do you think that uh, America could experience revival again? He, and he, with tears, says, Yes, but I'm not so sure if the people are willing to pay the price for revival. Revival does not come cheap. Revival is not an easy thing. We are in a, an age now where we like to drive up to something and somebody immediately speaks to us over a speaker. We flip a switch. We immediately want something done on the screen. We want everything done at our time and when we want it according to our hours. And we want everything done the way we want it. And sometimes when it comes to revival, we think, well, we're going to put God uh, on a situation like that where we're going to say, God, here I am. You've got so many hours for me. You've got so many days this week. Now give me revival or I'm going to leave. Well, you're going to leave without revival. Some of the older preachers from, from years past, they laugh. <laughs> they laugh when they, some people say, well, we're going to have a revival in a week. And, it's, you know, we can, we can touch, experience a touch of revival, but a real old-fashioned revival, you don't push into a, into a time scale. Old-fashioned revival starts uh, early, and our nation is in dire need of revival because our churches are in dire need of revival. And our churches are in dire need of revival because our people are in dire need of revival. Or we can blame it on the nation, we can blame it on some of the other churches, but basically revival starts with an individual. And you know that you know if this church here did not even experience revival, that you know that you can have revival in your own heart and life? God does not limit it to a certain church. He does not limit it to a certain few. God limits it to the people who would pay the price for revival. I'm convinced as I meditate on this, many of our problems we're experiencing in our families, many problems we're experiencing in our churches is simply because we're not where we should be with God. And, no, and of course, we don't like anybody to tell us that. Because we like to think more highly of ourselves sometimes than we are. And as a church, we don't like to, we will say, well, we're better than his other churches. Yes, but are we where God wants us to be? The question is, do we need revival? And the bigger question is, are you willing to seek revival? And 2010 could be one of the greatest years for this church. 2010 could be one of the greatest years for you as an individual Christian. But revival is not easy. Revival is not cheap, but if we, I tell you what, if we pay God's price for it, revival is 
definitely uh, promise and we will receive it. Let's look at a few things about revival tonight. First of all, from our text, we find that the people of revival, the people of revival, we find that first of all, it is a purchased people. You know, lost people don't get revived. Lost people don't get revived. You know, so many times when I was, when after I got saved and I went to church, I mean, they were talking about revival meetings. After all, what I saw, I saw people come and get saved. After all, I got saved at a revival meeting. I thank God for that. And in, and in many revival meetings I've seen, I've seen a lot of people come and get saved. But guess what? That's not what revival is about. Revival is about the people of God being revived. And when people of God get revived, you see people getting saved. Revive means you're revitalizing something that may have uh, lost some of the power that it had or lost some of the effect that it had. We need revival. The child of God needs revival. The purchased people need revival. The purchased people who were bought uh, by the Lord. They're bought with a price. We're not our own, the scripture says. We're not, we don't belong to ourselves anymore. We have been bought and paid for, and we have been bought and paid for by the highest price that ever could be paid. That is through the precious blood of Christ, according uh, to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses uh, 18 and 19. We're, we're, we're redeemed with a, with, not with corruptible uh, things, but with the incorruptible and precious blood of Christ. I mean, Christ bought us. Christ bought me. Christ bought you if you're saved. And I'm telling you what, if you're here tonight and you've never been saved, that's the same price that's going to buy you. You know, when somebody buys something like that and pays a big price, it's because they either really, really want something like that or they really, really have a real strong use for that which they're, going, they're buying. And I thank God that, that he, well, he, he paid that price because not only one, he loved me. He wanted me. Hey, Jesus wanted you. And sometimes we wonder, why would he want us? Because he sure got the bad end of the deal, did he not? But he wants you. He loves us. He died for us. And he was willing to pay the supreme sacrifice, the payment of his blood for you. And he owns you if you're saved by God's grace. And we're a part of his purchased people. He was bought by the Lord, but he was bought for us. I mean, bought for his use. The verse the pastor quoted this morning, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, except the one to God, which is your reasonable service. He's not asking too much for us when we do that. He says, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what God wants from us and the purchase that He's made. He wants us to live for Him. But you know, sometimes we, uh, we find that He has to do a lot of work on these things to make it uh, work to the efficiency it needs to be doing. He bought me. I found out He, he, he knew when He was getting me what He had to do. He knew all the knots on my head that He had to knock off. He knew all the rough edges he had to take, take when he took me. And he knew the same thing about you. But he wouldn't have purchased you if he thought you were worthless. There is hope. There is a, a place in his plan for you and a place that you can do in his service. It's a purchase people to get revived. It's only the same people that God, God revives. And he works on us. And I'm telling you what, some have more knots on their heads than others. And some of them have more problems than others, but he can see the finished work. He can see the finished product. And he is content to work with us till he can get us to the place where we're pleasing in his sight. So the people of revival is, first of all, a purchased people. Second of all, it is a purged people. In John chapter 15 and verse 2, he tells us he purges those vines. You know, someone who is in the husbandry and, uh, and takes, play, uh, takes care of the grapevine, the things, know that there's a work that has to be done. You can put the fertilizer right there, you can put the water out there, but sometimes the vines just don't act, grow the way they should. Sometimes there's some branches that get in there and get dead. 